So today we have John uh, Regeer. John is a, prof a professor of computer science at the University of Utah, where he has been on the faculty since 2003. His research is on compilers, software testing, and formal verification. And from myself, I, I, would, I would actually like to add that John is well known within LLVM community. The tools that he worked on found hundreds of bugs in LL Clang, and also John has served uh, on, on, on several LLVM uh, program committees. So John, welcome, and thanks for coming. Hi, thank you for inviting me. Yeah, it, that's great to have you here. Well, John, uh, you know, I, I actually, so I, I know you wrote many papers, and I, and I think I, I read at least three of them. And my favorite, actually, paper is, is, you know, is what's called Future Directions for Optimizing Compilers. This is, this is I think, the, the, the great paper, you know, the great vi visionary paper. And this paper you mentioned, uh, I don't know how it's pronounced, but it's like a Probsting law, right? <laughs> so which says that performance of the code that is generated by compilers every 18 years. And some people actually believe that it's somewhere around 50 years. Do you do you kind of you know share the same pessimistic view, or 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 you are more optimistic about it? <laughs> yeah, good. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I also think that I, I think it's true that that 18 years is optimistic. I think it's um, I think it's not. Uh, you know, I think it's I think it's less. You know, I, yeah, I think I think it takes more than 18 years for a compile for compiler improvements to double the the performance of existing code, and so. So the thing is, I don't think it's really depressing, um, you know, because it sort of assumes um, Probstein's law, kind of the phrasing of it, assumes, you know, a way that it assumes that some sort of an environment that doesn't exist, doesn't work. We don't leave software and, har and hardware platforms unchanged, and then only change the compiler. So, you know, it's just it's just it's just not reflective of of, of the real world. It's not reflective of of you know how the kind of improvements in compilers have, um, you know, are really are really very impressive. And um, you know, and, and and so so again, I think it's true that the, the law is narrowly true, or even or even optimistic. But that doesn't mean that the that the real situation is 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 bad. It just means that it just means that you can't leave the hardware platform and the um, uh, and the and your software code base unchanged. You know, especially when it's already written in in low level performance oriented ways. You just can't expect stuff to 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 double in speed or keeping increasing in speed. So the you know the real improvements in compilers have been in taking higher level languages and you know producing impressive performance out of that, or in terms of much better diagnostics and much better uh, debugging tools and you know the, the the overall kind of improvements sort of you know they're 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 different than what Probstein's law sort of primes us to expect I guess and so 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 it's kind of a misleading it's kind of a, it's it's funny right is why it, but it, but it's but it's misleading and not reflective of of the real gains that we're getting from compilers. Right, yeah, and then you know, so there is there is such a su such a let's say the such a perception that you know that well, I mean, uh, maybe maybe you know I don't need that you know ten percent performance improvement. I will just better have you know two x compile time. I mean, uh, to my two two, two x uh, better compile time, right? So um, yeah, I mean, um, it's, uh, yeah, that's interesting. By the way, let me just quickly actually mention that we have a Discord channel. Yeah, sorry about not mentioning it in the beginning, but we have a Discord channel. It, I actually pasted the link, um, uh, uh, like on 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 the Twitter right right uh, before right in the announcement uh, on my profile. So if you wanna like you know ask uh, ask questions or comments, then you can do it on this Discord channel. Okay. Right, so so let's go back to 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 our topic, right? So so John, speaking about the LVM compiler, this is something you know uh, you and me we 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 let's say both worked on. But so how much do you think you know headroom there is in existing LLVM optimization passes? So you're saying you said the question of how much more improvement is there to get out of of you know existing codes. Right. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I think it's super, super, super situational. You know, we can find pretty tweaked stuff, you know, where, you know, people have really beaten the, you know, be beaten the hot spots out of it. And, you know, you can find codes of, you know, in which there's very, very little headroom, you know, you know, small percent at most. But, you know, but then of course we can find, you know, there's there's lots of 
there's lots of code, especially higher level stuff where there's a huge amount of headroom, I think, and the compiler is just incapable of sort of extinguishing the abstract and sort of, it just kind of leaves them hanging there, hanging there and they execute, you know, when they, when they wouldn't need to. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's so incredibly situational that it, you know, that it's almost, it's almost sort of hard to talk about without, without sort of, you know, so without some additional, um, without narrowing it down, I guess. Right. Yeah. But do you, like, like, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I, 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 I understand what you say and it's, it, it's exactly like hard to estimate, but, uh, like, like what's your, you know, guts feeling? Is it like below, below 5%, below, below 1% or like maybe like even more than, I don't know, 50%. Like so, so how much, how much, you know, I mean, how much, uh, how much more we can tune those those optimization passes so that the general purpose application, you know, you know, can uh, can be improved. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's it's. I mean, it's super interesting. But but let, like, let's just take a program for example. Let's take maybe um, Gzip or Bzip or something. Um, you know, I suspect that for existing hardware platforms, the the headroom just isn't there. There, there. there can't be much, right? People have paid so much attention to making these codes run fast and tweak them to match the hardware and tweak them to match the compiler. Um, you know, so, so, in, so in those terms, you know, and for some of the stuff that's pretty optimized already, there just isn't re really, really isn't, isn't much headroom. But, you know, if you take something like, um, I don't know, let's, let's, let's forget about LLVM for a second and take something like Eclipse. Um, you know, I, I, I always think about Eclipse when I think about performance because on the first laptop that I owned where I actually ran Eclipse, the first time I started it, it took something like a minute to start up. I mean, it was just it was just unbelievable to watch this this kind of um, amazing megabytes of, of stuff get jitted just to bring this this um, environment up on my computer. You know, cl clearly something like that has an enormous amount of headroom, right? And um, you know that the, there's just an awful lot going on that wouldn't need to happen every time you start it. And um, you know, but the, you know, this is software written in a fair, you know, in a higher level language, and um, you know, and there's just a lot of abstraction there that 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 you sort of pay for every single time you every single time you call it up. So, so I guess I'm not answering your question again. Um, <laughs> uh. <laughs> okay, uh, let let me ask actually this one. So, uh, what what do you think about you know new those fancy uh, fancy things in compiler technology? Like what, what what we are trying to bring in, uh, I'm talking about like you know machine learning, synthesis, and others. Like do you do 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 you think that you know that the that, that I mean, um, do you think that this will pan out in the future? Yeah, that's a, that's super interesting, and I think it will. I think that compilers, um, there've been a whole lot of really impressive improvements in how we build them. But when at the end of the day, they're 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 very they're very hand constructed objects, you know, sort of, you know, so, so t taking LLVM, for example, there are sort of a million little decisions inside this compiler that, uh, you know, just data structure choice and stuff that um, that affect sort of how the compiler works. And then there's sort of a million little assumptions about, um, about how, you know, how hard the compiler should try to do particular things. And so one of my favorites is there's a whole bunch of constants inside the compiler that are like four and five and six, which is the number of instructions back that it's willing to look when doing some sort of a data flow analysis, when it's, for example, trying to trying to prove, for example, that a number is positive or something because it could use that to optimize. So, you know, so so this five instruction thing, you know, why why is it five? Well, it's because as you push backwards, you know, you entrain more code, um, you entrain more code as you go back, and so the compiler becomes intolerably slow if we turned it to a seven. Um, but on the other hand, if we did that, it would, you know, there'd be a few codes where we get more precise results and we generate better code. So there's sort of millions and not millions, there's many, many of these uh, little decisions baked into compilers. And I, and you know, they're, they're, they become sort of ossified and hard to change and hard to, um, hard to reevaluate them as, as thing, as the situation changes, you know, so, for, you know, now we're compiling, you know, Julia or something with LLVM, which is, you know, pretty far outside the scope of what LLVM was originally, originally doing, you know, in its first couple of years. And you know, but, but but so we're compiling these sort of pretty new languages, pretty different languages, but we're doing it with these same decisions that were basically baked in to, to be a pretty okay C compiler, you know, in the early 2000s or, or you know, when when people were for first putting this stuff together. And so so I think to me to me the role of things like machine learning are that the compiler would um, would be able to adapt itself to the situation sort of. So let's just sort of take the situation where. Um, there are a lot of little parameters to tweak in the compiler and we're suddenly doing something totally different than we used to do. Now, you know, now we're compiling Julia. Well, what if all those little knobs could be tweaked automatically so that they did a good job on Julia code? And we do that, you, you know, we do this using a cluster 
And we do this over a period of months, maybe, or weeks. And at the end, you know, we have a different set of um, tweaks and settings for the knobs that make the compiler do a much better job. And we didn't have to do that by hand. Because if we do this stuff by hand, it's, you know, it's, it's sort of years and years of slow, painful adjustments. And a lot of those adjustments just never get done. We sort of work around the damage in other ways, or eventually we sort of throw away the compiler. And so I think that, you know, just, just taking the machine learning part, you know, sort of machine learning in kind of a deep way, like recognizing the cheetah in the picture, you know, I don't, I don't think that kind of machine learning has necessarily too much of a place. But on the other hand, taking up, you know, some sort of an interesting piece of code and figuring out how to best lay it out onto some particular machine pipeline, um, you know, that's, you know, maybe, maybe that's, maybe, maybe that's almost, maybe that's equally sophisticated or so, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe that is sort of a fairly strong form of machine learning. If you, if you can, if, you know, if you can sort of come up with a near optimal code, um, you know, for, for some machine that you haven't explicitly targeted the compiler at, if that makes sense. That makes perfect sense. So, yeah, so, so you are talking that we can replace essentially all the heuristics and cost models with machine learning models, right? That's, I think, the, the sort of the dream, yeah. And then you get a lot of benefit from that. You can, you can update the models faster. You can um, have different models. So when we're compiling Julia code, we might have, we may have a totally different set of inlining heuristics than we use when we're compiling C++ code. And, you know, we could just sort of swap these out and we're not sort of stuck with this one size fits all approach that we have now, which is, you know, which is, I think, um, you know, it, 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 it creates, creates some impedance mismatch for, for people trying to, you know, trying to target LLVM for, for, with, new, with new platforms. They have to sort of deal with this, this fact that it really wasn't designed necessarily for what they're doing. And yeah, so exactly. I think, I think we can replace a lot of these, a lot of these things with, with, with learned models. And really, you know, people, it's, it's not that fun coming up with these models by hand because they get, they get spread out over the code base. They're, you know, they're, they're very slow to change. And then they're just sort of, um, you know, they're inaccurate. They're bad frankly, and they're old, you know, there, there's a lot of stuff, you know, probably that can, comes from Pentium Pros and Pentium 2s and 3s and stuff baked into GCC still, for example, just because, you know, those, nobody's had time to go and reevaluate whatever parts of the code the stuff is baked into. And some of the places where it's baked in are really well hidden, right? It may just be in the sort of um, structure of the code itself. And there's not like an explicit, you know, three that, hiding in the code somewhere that you can change to a five or, or whatever, whatever you want to do to, to make something work, work a little differently. That makes sense. Yeah, uh, Boris, you have you have something to say? Yeah, sorry, I was just listening to your explanation of all these heuristics hidden in the compiler, uh, and one of the uh, terms that I encounter that's uh, kind of trying hard to understand what actually is, but uh, have a very limited success in doing so, is differential pr differentiable programming, and I was wondering if that is actually one of the uh, approaches you can use to optimize some of these heuristics or not, and if you this term, I've uh, unfortunately I've only heard of the term, and I don't, and I really don't know how that how that would be relevant. I, I really haven't looked into it. I'm sorry. All right, no problem. Sure. Okay. So, but now let, let me ask about super optimizers because. Uh, Oh, okay. We, yeah. So, hi, Steve. Yeah, j j just g give me a second, and I, I will, I will give you um, a chance to to ask questions after that. So, uh, super optimizers, right, John? So, this is uh, something you know you you worked on, um, and you actually developed like a super, right? Um, and then, so do you do you think that you know there is a chance that we might see an online super optimizer in the compilers, or you know that 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 will never happen essentially, and this is, you know, uh, and super optimizers will always, you know, leave offline. So what's your uh, vision here? Yeah, that's, that's, that's interesting. Um, so, so let me first sort of start off by sort of saying what we mean by super here for people who aren't, um, you know, for people who, 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 who don't work in this quite. Um, we basically mean sort of non-trivial search baked into the compiler. And so, you know, when the compiler wants to lay out a basic block or something, it, what it currently does is, you know, it has some sort of a heuristic you know, collection of techniques and heuristics for, for placing the instructions. And it doesn't do, sort of do any sort of a search for the best way to lay out the base, it just sort of knows how to do it. So if we use kind of a meaningful search coupled with a cost model, then we could, for example, lay out the instructions in such a way that they, you know, that, that they're going to fit into the pipeline best. And so that's what a super, miser, a super optimizer is, is a sort of non-trivial search and generally it has to be coupled with, again, some sort of cost estimate or else maybe just run stuff on the actual hardware to, to measure the cost. And um, yeah, so the question is, can that is, does that sort of heavyweight search have a role in you know, mainstream compilation? And I, I'm tempted to say kind of no, just because comp compile time is just so incredibly important 
um, for you know for in many in many use for many use cases. Um, we almost always just kind of want the compiler to go fast, and it's so much work. Uh, already, all the things that the compiler has to do to, you know, smash all of the templates and all these other things, breakdowns, and then sort of try to target some sort of a machine. There's so much work to do that making that job, you know, I hate it when people use the word exponentially casually, right? But here it is, at making the job, making the problem exponentially worse because there's an, you know, the search spaces for these sorts of things always always have an ex exponential character, and so. You know, I, th I think mostly no, but you know, on the other hand, you can imagine hard compilers for hardware. Um, we know where we certainly would be willing to to wait. And you know, you could you could imagine specific modes of LLVM or whatever that would be much slower that would do a better job. But most of the time, we just don't want to deal with that. We, it's just it's it for developers. It's too much of an impedance mismatch. And having a rapid rapid feedback cycle, rapid development cycle, is so much more important than um, you know than having the code uh, be 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 a little bit faster generally. I mean, obviously, that's not true in all cases, right? But broadly speaking, for 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 software developers, uh, a fast compiler is really, really, really important. Right, that makes sense to me. Uh, uh, hi, uh, Julia Rappel, you 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 wanted to say? Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Um, nice to meet everyone. Hi, John. Um, I believe that um, Boris was asking about what automatic differentiation was, and I just tweeted out a good explainer that was made by Chris Rakakis who is really pushing forward that um, is part of the effort to push that forward in the Julia ecosystem. So if you go to my profile, I just tweeted um, a really good Stack Exchange post that they made. Um, so John, if you want to look that up, that'd be interesting for you, I think. And coming back to what you were saying, John, about you know maybe all of these compiler heuristics can be overtaken by machine learning models. Do you think that there's any space for that to be gained from automated or interactive theorem proving techniques and or SAT solvers, because that also seems to be a place where um, maybe these heuristics don't need to be heuristics anymore. Yeah, that's really interesting. So, so first of all, thanks for the, for the differential program thing. I mean, I, I do need to read that. Um, yeah. So for using solvers and stuff. So I generally, the, when I kind of think of this to myself, I divide up uh, compiler engineering problems into sort of hard problems and soft problems. And the hard ones are the ones where you can't be wrong. You know, you can't, you know, you, you look at the wrong flag or something. And soft problems are ones where you have a, you have a, a choice and you can only, uh, you know, you, you won't break the correctness guarantees if you, if you break them. So you may select the wrong instruction and it's slower, but it's not, uh, not, not incorrect. And so the way I kind of usually think of it is, is that the interactive theorem provers um, or else uh, SMT solvers and such, those really have a strong role to play in the, on the correctness side. And I don't think of them, I sort of think of them as basically being, you know, separate than the soft problems that we want to solve with machine learning. They're almost, they're, you know, they're almost kind of completely separate things. And it's, you know, and it's not the case, it's not the case that this is, these are completely separate worlds because I could, for example, use a solver to come up, if I had sort of a solver based model for a machine pipeline, um, then I could use some sort of a MinSat sort of a thing, uh, you know, an opta, a solver driven uh, a solver that's equipped to solve, solve optimization problems. I can use some sort of a MinSat thing to come up with a layout for my program that fit best in the pipeline. But mostly that's very, very tough stuff um, to sort of encode a performance model into a solver. And, you know, mostly the things we're doing are hard enough just worrying about correctness with solvers and adding another layer of what we'd like to try to solve using these theorem provers. Um, you know, it's, it's hard. It may, it may be coming sort of in a more distant future, but it's, but it's quite, quite challenging in the, in the sort of short-term future. Okay, cool. Thanks, John. Uh, so w l let me actually uh, now ask about what do you think about PGO and profile guided optimizations? Well, actually, my personal belief is that uh, those things and, and, you know, and actually tools like Bolt from Facebook, I think, I mean, they, they can become even more important than, than they used to because, and I think actually from looking from, not, not, not from Julia, but from C++ perspective, I think we are, you know, we are not utilizing uh, the runtime information to the, to the extent that we could. And I mean, you know, the, the simplest example is actually that, you know, we're still not able to do a branch to C move conversion, uh, you know, based on the profiling, profiling data, right? And I think, um, I mean, I understand that that's actually maybe not uh, always easy to do because, I mean, for example, you know, not all the hardware provides the capabilities to to extract this runtime data, right? But uh, I mean, still, at, at least for x86 or 
I don't know. I think we can we can do that. So 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 John, what's your opinion on 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 the importance of PGO? Yeah, it's it's interesting. I'm not sure that I have good opinions about this, but I think it's interesting and sort of odd that it's been so available, understood, and mature technology for you know really kind of a long time, and yet it sort of seems to always be on the back burner. And I I guess I I guess what I really want to say is I don't I'm not sure I totally understand the trade offs and what's going on there, because it sort of seems like this free lunch, but then. What I guess I, I, th I think it's a little bit like something like pre-compiled headers, where technology isn't that hard. It kind of seems like a free lunch, but then we don't really end up using it much. And I think, I think sometimes these things just add enough sort of turbulence into the workflow that, you know, just most of the time, it's not really quite worth it um, for most of our use cases where, you know, for most developers who aren't writing the most performance sensitive stuff, it probably adds enough friction that we just don't bother with it, I guess. Um, yeah, so 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 it's, I think I think it's one of these things where we have to ask, you know, why haven't why hasn't it made more of an impact yet? Given that, you know, is is it just the engineering challenges, or is it, uh, you know, I guess I'm I'm not really sure, and it's not something I've worked on directly, so I don't I don't really have the kind of understanding, you know, depth of understanding of this that the you know that that, that it would take to to have a have a have a better answer here, I guess. Okay. Uh, and, and now, what do you think about you know reoptimizing on the fly? Like 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 for example, some some compilers do. Uh, <laughs> I mean, do you think that that's uh, that's you know possible to do it all in 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 C in C plus plus or or it's just uh, you know <laughs> uh, like too too much in the future? Yeah, I don't know. Um, so you're saying we we just have a JIT, effectively a JIT for C plus plus that would go back and reevaluate things when they're if they're really hot. Yeah, um, I mean, it clearly it'd be possible to do. Um, you know, of course, there's a lot of use cases for C++ where that just wouldn't work. You know, you could imagine, you know, almost any embedded system, this would be using a lot of memory at runtime and then injecting timing unpredictability into the system. So, so you know, so, so there's a lot of use cases. And, you know, probably it's similar for games and things. A lot of our highest performance use cases may not take that kind of stuttering glitchiness that, that you would tend to get by doing a, you know, trying to do a good job reoptimizing things. But on the other hand, you know, JITs work you know, just are incredibly great technology. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It's it's sort of it is sort of weird that C plus plus is seems to completely lack JITs, and I you know I, I guess I guess it's just sort of um, the the entire ecosystem and all of the expectations of users and everything else is just kind of based around the different comp the ahead of time model, and um, so I guess people just haven't found it worth it. Maybe. Right. Yeah. Maybe. <clears throat> okay. Uh let's now switch topics a little bit uh, and uh, you, and, you know I, I think that in in the past uh, basically like hardware and compilers were the two primary drivers for performance and do you, do you think that uh, do you think that the same trend continue like will will continue in the future well I don't know let's see um... Can you change the question a little bit? Like, let's, or... yeah. So, yeah. So, so essentially, what I'm saying is that wh 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 where do you think the performance will come from in in the future? Is it hardware? Is it OS? Is it compilers? I don't know. Maybe, maybe like you know, we should we, we should go and change. You know, the the uh, I mean, maybe maybe the the performance improvement will come like from the application level. Yeah, that's um, <laughs> that's a that's a super hard question. Um, well, the you know one of, of course one of the really interesting things that's happening is you know the, the sort of explosion in architectural speed up th things to you know si since we stopped getting single core speed up um, or since we stopped getting very much single core speed up the sort of explosion of you know tensor accelerators and all these all these other things all these other hardware units that kind of sit around the cores and it's really really interesting and sort of somehow folding that into the software d development workflow in a kind of um, more seamless fashion seems like a really serious challenge for, for all of us. And I don't really, you know, I don't even necessarily have any strong ideas about how to attack that. Um, you know, so yeah, I mean, a lot of that, a lot of the kind of interesting hardware is more, you know, is, is not incredibly easy to target with automated code generation. And, um, you know, and, and, and especially, you know, and even when it is, you sort of have to redesign the software and partition the software yourself. And it's all very much um, kind of, I don't want to say in conflict, but at all, it's all very awkward from a position of programming languages where we just want sort of to describe what we want to happen at a high level. And we don't even want to, you know, we, we'd like to not even uh, concurrency and parallelism. You know, we'd like to sort of just say, you know, all these things should happen and, and something kind of takes care of it. 
And it's almost like the hardware people are, you know, while giving us what we want, making our lives, you know, sort of as, as compiler and language people making our lives quite a lot more difficult. And um, it's, I think it's super hard to see where it's all going, um, except that, you know, so one of the people who I think is on here, yeah, I, I see him on the screen, Steve, Steve Cannon, he's, you know, he, for example, is a person who does, um, you know, takes the hottest, you know, some of the hottest loops at Apple and makes them run fast on whatever the hardware is. And, you know, so to some extent, as long as we have, you know, enough Steves in the world, most of the rest of us can just kind of write high level software and not worry about all these, um, you know, incredible accelerators and stuff. But, you know, but it'd be really nice if there was a different world where we didn't sort of have to rely on having, uh, you know, some of these people who kind of devote their careers to, you know, writing really optimized code. And, you know, if we, if we could, if we could somehow, you know, meet in the middle with the programming languages, but, but I really don't know how that's going to happen. Yeah, I think, I think you, you actually touched a really, really interesting point. Right. So, 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 uh, right. So I, I mean, I mean, compiler, compilers in the future probably will, will have to focus more on offloading and, and all, and all this kind of stuff. And let's actually talk about, you know, um, okay. So, so, I think you are, yeah, what, 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 what you are saying is that, you know, that tra uh, like how we think about traditional optimizing compilers will not maybe true, you know, in, in the future, right? So it's not only about, about, you know, doing like classical code transformation and so on and so forth, but it's also uh, helping, helping, you know, extract performance in non-traditional ways. Um, what what do I think you you know are are other non traditional ways? Yeah, I think, or if, if there are any. Yeah, no, no, no. I think that's really I think that's really an interesting direction, and and I, and I, something I hope to see a lot more of is, yeah, a compiler that sort of looks at your application and helps you tease it apart into into pieces that would you know better be a better match for multiple cores or a better match for whatever accelerators you have out there. Something to kind of help with this, and I, I you know realistically I think this is very hard, but I think that the sort of more less of the model where we just go over the wall to the brilliant tool, which does a good job and more of a model where, you know, it's just more interactive where there's, there's some back and forth and it kind of works with us to refactor things so that we can, um, so that we can get better performance. And I think, I think the really cool, one of the really cool things to see would be, you know, well, I, so that's a really hard thing to have the software because what we want is the compiler kind of answers the question, you know, what's the best this could have done? You know, what's the best that some other version of this code could do? And, you know, and, and that some of the version hopefully is one that's not too hard, not too far from what we have now. And these kind of hypothetical questions like this are, you know, enormously hard for, uh, for tools like compilers to answer. But I think that this would be, this would be really good as opposed to, you know, what compilers do now sort of is, um, you know, they just sort of take, take what you give it and, um, you know, do the best they can, which often isn't that good. I had, let me, let me just tell a, a silly story. So when I was an undergrad, I worked uh, as a programmer and we were doing some imaging of some plant imaging. And so we were using ray tracers. And my boss, my supervisor in this job got, got a bunch of time on some cray somewhere. And so I was like, wow, we've been waiting for this silly ray tracer. So I took the ray tracer and I, um, I uh, sort of glued all of the files together by hand into one huge compilation unit because I figured the cray, this cray machine would have this unbelievable whole program optimizer because I didn't understand anything at the time. This is, you know, early nineties. And so then I shipped that one file over to the Cray, compiled it and ran it. And it went, it ran about as fast as the 486 or whatever um, that I had on my desk already. Because of course, you know, this thing was just this enormous mess of completely uncrayable code. Um, you know, the, the, the Cray compiler couldn't do anything interesting with it. And um, anyway, so it was sort of, you know, it's one of these things where, you know, you sort of hope you can take something and throw it over the wall and something good happens, but, you know, far, far, far too often that just, you know, nothing of the sort happens. The compiler doesn't do a good job and doesn't tell you why and doesn't give you any help. And so you're sort of left um, with very rudimentary tools trying to figure out what, what, what went wrong. And this, you know, and again, the story sort of sticks with me just because it just, I, it's kind of funny that, you know, that somebody would be that naive, but um, anyway, I, I just, it just sort of sticks with me as, as, you know, something should have been able to tell me that I was doing something kind of dumb there and, you know, nothing did. And I had to kind of figure it all out for myself. And, you know, and it, you know, there, there's a lot of room for improvement here, I think. Right, that's interesting. Yeah, I actually ju just want to uh, also to say that I actually, so I had a conversation with Chandler Caruso uh, like uh, half a year ago, maybe, and and he actually, you know, he actually said that that I mean we should like com compilers will maybe should stop even focus on open and should you know focus on on really on helping on you know on building tools and helping uh, performance engineers really to uh, you know to make their work more efficient. Like uh, it, I mean, I mean it, it it still you know it's not it's not precise and. Um, 
it's it's not clear how exactly we, we can achieve that, but maybe you know with some uh, better tools, maybe with some you know uh, better recommendation systems. I don't know because compilers are already great. Parsing code, they're doing all sorts of also all sorts of analysis, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I think I agree with Chandler about that. That, that that's a that's a really good vision, and 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 more of that. And then I think also so so mostly you by performance so far here, but you know, but I think also having the compiler interact with you quite a bit more on correctness would be would be a really good thing. And you know, the performance and correctness are are related in the sense that if you can if you can worry less about correctness, you can sort of write riskier code. If you see what I mean, you don't have to write code that's quite as boring and straightforward. If you um, if you're if you're less worried about getting it wrong, and um, you know, and so so I, you know, so so having having smarter worrying less about correctness, I think is is, is definitely a performance uh, issue as well. But um, yeah, I think I think having the compiler, um, you know, and, and of course there are compilers that do help us with correctness. You know, so for example, uh, Spark Ada is sort of legendary uh, for you know in, in some use cases, legendarily good at sort of. Um, providing you support with uh, sort of theorem prover support for, for getting contracts that are sort of workable in your code and making sure that they're not gonna be violated. And um, so to me, that's a really, that, that's another really, really big part of all this is trying to, you know, trying to help the programming environments uh, help us write correct code, you know, in, in more ways than just things like sanitizers and warnings and, and these, other, these other sorts of things that we have. Right. Yeah, let's, uh, let's now set performance aside for, for, for a little bit for a moment. and. Uh... Uh, so, what think uh, compiler technology should focus on on for the next decade? Is it software correctness? Is it security? Maybe developer productivity? Yeah, um, I think I'm pretty traditional on this. I think that we just want you know mostly compilers uh, to a large extent. I just want them to do what they're doing, but do it better. You know, they should be they should be easier to retarget. They should be, um, easier to um, target with front ends. They should. Uh, you know, we should be able to, you know, the, this, the, the kind of things we ask a C++ compiler to do every time it runs, <clears throat> that is to, you know, flatten a whole lot of um, template metaprogramming and stuff. You know, this just takes a lot of time. And, and you know, it, I'd like to sort of think that there's ways to do these, do these jobs much faster and much better. And I don't, you know, I don't, I don't really know what they are. But, um, yeah, so I think, you know, I, I just think the, the, the right things and we're going in the right directions just sort of need to do, do more of it. And um, you know, it's it's a really if you think about it, it's a really incredibly successful piece of technology. And the fact that most programmers don't really care that much about compilers, you know, it just basically means you know that that they work well. And those of us who do care about them have have basically, you know, I think I think done done a good job. Um, can I ask a question about future directions as well? Sure. Um, so I think I made this uh, question to John uh, privately, but I might as well open up. Maybe he's had a, uh, some thoughts since then. So what's interesting, what's really cool about LLVM is that you have this uh, entire middle pass architecture that's modular. And so you can replace and hack all of the internals for the compiler. And that's a really great added value versus working on GCC itself. Um, what do you think are future directions that would be interesting to see in a compiler that would, you would consider next generation, right? So LLVM is super hackable and modular. What would be like a value added say, okay, this would be what the next generation of compilers would have an added value versus just like added engineering and hard work and, you know, good old elbow grease. Yeah, sure. Well, that's you guys, no, Nobody's asking easy questions here today. Um, well, so one of the things we can sort of look at that I think is interesting is so, so let's take a look at, for example, some of the things that LLVM isn't good at. So, you know, adding a new instruction is a pain because, you know, it's like on the surface, this is easy, but when you dig into it, it turns out you have to, 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 to keep code gen from suffering, you have to kind of teach so many different parts of the compiler about the new instruction that this can be a really long, slow effort to sort of, you know, get everything up to, up to speed. And so as, some, as part of some correctness work um, we did a few years ago, we added this freeze instruction to LLVM. So freeze basically takes an undef value and um, makes it so that it's no longer free floating. So an undef in LLVM, you know, it's kind of a free floating register and you get a different value every time you look at it. Freeze takes it and, and turns it into a single or arbitrarily chosen value. So this is kind of, you know, it's not a super, super difficult thing, um, but you know, it's, it's really slow and laborious to sort of now teach all the different parts about the compiler. And even now, several years later, it's really hard to, um, you, you, can't, you can't put 
freezes into certain kinds of code because it'll blow up, for example, a loop optimization. And then pe you know, people sort of get, get, get angry with you and you just, you just can't push that commit into the compiler. So it's super, super, super cool and extensible infrastructure and it's amazingly useful, but there are these other angles along which it's not particularly good or extensible. And then we have some sort of subsequent infrastructure. So for example, MLI MLIR, you, know, you can view that as being somewhat about you know, you know, fixing some of the mistakes made in all of YAM. And, you know, and, and this kind of extensibility, ma making it be able, making you able to support different dialects is, you know, I think, you know, that was one of the, I think, I think some of the shortcomings for LLVM were, were kind of some of the main motivations in, in this, in the creation of this. And I think that's a, you know, it's a really good thing. It's really good if you have some sort of new piece of hardware. Hi, John. I see, I see. I think you we just lost you, so or your mic is muted. I'm sorry, I must have. I, mean, I th it was. I brushed. I think I brushed my. I think I brushed my screen with my hand. Sorry. Um, well, anyway, I was kind of rambling anyway. Um, <laughs> but uh, so let me tell you, let me let me let me actually switch gears a little bit and talk about a piece of correctness work that I think is is that I'm really sort of proud of. And this is uh, this 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 work is more. Um, I'm I'm involved and I work on it, but it's more my colleague Nuno Lopez who's the main driver, which is this this. Uh, infrastructure called Alive 2 that we have, which does translation validation for LLVM. So basically, if you have a pass that, for example, um, changes uh, a couple of instructions into a smaller instruction sequence that accomplishes the same job, there's a lot of ways for that to go wrong. And this tool that we wrote basically looks at the code before and after the translation, before and after the optimization, and asks the question, did the optimization do the right thing? And so kind of like in isolation, that's pretty easy to do, but this tool has gotten to the point where you can compile something big, like um, you know you can compile C SQLite or something, and every optimization that the compiler does on every function that it's being called, you can actually just prove that correct uh, as it happens. And um, this is, I, I think this is really exciting stuff. And to me, this is, so, so we, we like to hear a talk about uh, infrastructure like concert where the compiler is kind of mostly proved correct. And to me, that's not really the future. The future is you let compiler engineers do their job the way they want to do it. And then we have this kind of tool on the side that watches it and makes sure it did the right thing. And that's in some sense harder because you don't have all the little breadcrumbs. You didn't engineer the compiler with verifiability. But on the other hand, it lets the compiler engineers do their job as they want to do the, their job. And then we can sort of, try, we attack the problem separately. And I really think that so sort of that's kind of the only way forward. But the cool thing is this basically already works. We can, for a, for a pretty fraction of optimizations performed by LLVM, we can basically just prove them all correct. And, um, you know, and of course, when we're doing this, we also see a bunch of known bugs uh, come through. You know, even when you build something pretty simple, the compiler trips over a bunch of, uh, a bunch of bugs that, that, that we know about and are, that are hard to fix. And uh, more, more, you know, mostly these are sort of undefined behavior related things that, that, that stay latent. The, the transformations don't sort of, um, don't, result in a binary that actually does the wrong thing mostly. But anyway, this kind of um, building compilers with some sort of this correctness stuff, um, the, you know, in such a way that you can do that kind of work like we did, I think that's really important in the future because then you can really sort of just start to start to trust the thing more. And anyway, I kind of rambled again there, sorry. <laughs> that's fine, that's fine. You can keep on going. Uh, <laughs> um, sorry, what was the name of the tool? Uh, I missed that bit. It's called Alive2. So if you go to alive2.lovm.org, it's a uh, compiler explorer instance that I hacked up and you can play with this tool. I hope I said the right, I, right. I hope I said the right URL. If I didn't, um, I'll follow up later. Right, John, uh, is there any fundamentally, uh, fundamental problem uh, solving which you would say like, well, okay, if we can solve that problem, then it will open, you know, a whole new class of, uh, of you know, of, of new new things that we can do now. I, I'm, 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 you know, I'm talking about some compiler problem. Yeah, well, the one of the ones that I like to think about, and and I don't necessarily have any particular ideas about, but you know, so compilers are really good at adjusting the instructions they emit. Um, you know, and they can they can compilers in sort of different circumstances can emit a wide variety of ways to do something. But compilers are really, they don't have much to say about our data structures. And sort of the best you can hope for uh, with current compilers is that if you sort of have a silly use of a data structure, like let's say I'm gonna do some sort of a conversion, this is, this is gonna be a dumb example, but it's what, I, it's what I can think of right now. Let's say I wanted to convert an integer to a um, float and I go through a string in the middle. So you can imagine a compiler optimization that would get rid of that you know, intermediate string step and, and just, just do the conversion the right way. 
So, so, so again, that's a silly example, but compilers that can sort of look at our data structures and not only, not only eliminate useless data structures that we've sort of put in for convenience, but also, you know, things that could sort of re rethink our data structures um, so, that, so that we didn't have to do all of that planning ourselves. I, you know, that, that's something that would, I, I feel like would be sort of a game changer. Right. And then things like, like AOS to SOA, this, the, like, m m make those, uh, you know, on, on the fly as well. Exactly. Yeah, but that's a, yeah, that's a, that's a really hard problem. And every, you know, there are, and it, it can go so, so like, it, it can go wrong in so many different ways. So, yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's an invasive whole program change. And the performance implications are not necessarily at all clear until you've done it. And yeah, exactly. So, so exactly this kind of thing. Um, compilers that could sort of, you, know, you can imagine Clippy coming up and saying, you know, did you not want to do an AOS there instead of an SOA? And, you know, and then, and then it just sort of does it for you or something. And, um, you know, or maybe, this, you know, the same source program, yeah, compiles with completely different data structures behind your back on different target platforms. You know, and then right now we mostly accomplish this with libraries, right? We can accomplish this with, with you know, by selecting the, li the right libraries, and then we can sort of delegate these choices to, to a library that can make these appropriate choices at runtime. But, you know, it, it seems like there's quite a bit of work for, for compiler, or sort of room for compilers to do the same kind of thing. All right. Okay, uh, uh, let's let's talk about programming models and um, and uh, and actually, so, so do, do you think, John, that you know? So okay, so let me uh, like for the background, right, uh, of where I'm going with this. Um, you know, as, as you said, right, we have a whole bunch of different accelerators accelerators already, right, and it's not uh, and it's it's not possible to program uh, many accelerators using the same programming models, right? So that's why you know. Uh, for for now, we have like uh, you know uh, multiple programming models specified for for uh, different hardware, right? Do you think you know uh, that uh, we'll have like in, in the future like a single or unified programming model, or we we you know or th that's essentially our, our future that we'll have you know many different DSLs, uh, you know, and programming models for for different hardware. Yeah, that's a super. That's that's interesting. So, so what I'll what I'll do is I'll sort of defer a little bit to something um, my colleague Matthew Flat, he's a programming language expert, says, which is that, you know, there's sort of a finite, smallish number of niches for languages. You know, so we're always going to need, you know, a Perl or a Bash or whatever. We're always going to need something like a C plus plus. We're always going to need something like a, you know, a, some sort of a numerical language. Um, you know, there, there's these there's a handful of niches, and. It seems like kind of what accelerators do is kind of create more of those, or maybe they don't create more of these niches, but they sort of, um, you know, they, they change the landscape. And I think we're stuck with the fact, for at least for a long time, we're stuck with the fact that, you know, um, for certain kinds of targets, you're going to need to think and lay out your code a certain kind of a way. And it just really, it, it seems really, really hard to get past that and move, you know, move to some sort of a to some sort of a situation where we have a unified view of all this stuff. And it's not even totally clear that that's the right answer. Because, for example, um, you know, you you can make programming environments that sort of like you know MATLAB or whatever. And you know, this is understandable and highly usable by people who are you know you know sort of real engineers, people who understand signal processing and filter feedback controllers. And you know they really want to use a different environment. There's no point trying to get them to use some some you know Pythony thing that, that that works really well for me or for or for maybe one of the more CSE sort of people. So I think so I think it's really the case that you know there's 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 a whole bunch of niches out there and um, you know and, and the accelerators change the landscape, but fundamentally they're you know I think we're stuck with lots of different environments until until we until we have a lot more sophistication in dealing with these problems than we have now. Right. So we actually. I, I... I think we have now, you know, uh, more more GPU programmers, and do you think that you know programming GPU is is hard? <laughs> I'm a terrible GPU programmer. I've I've written almost no GPU code. I'm actually really really bad. I'm also a really bad vector programmer. Um, I you know I, I there's all these things I haven't had time to get into. Um, but let me just just say one story that I really like, and and I don't know how how current this is, but so this is comes from sort of early days of CUDA. But somebody I was talking to had. Um, Taken a bunch of code and rewritten and rewritten it in CUDA, and sort of you know had gotten nice performance on GPUs, but then sort of on a lark had taken that those same rewritten codes and put them back on CPUs after there as well. And so there is something kind of fundamentally kind of fun and weird going on there, you know, by sort of rethinking the code in a in a, in a, in a sort of a little bit different, more data oriented way, had uh, freed up the other compiler as well, you know, in ways that the the, the person who told me the story hadn't expected to happen at all. 
Right. Yeah. Yeah. My personal, you know, view on this is that well, okay. So I, I I'm actually also a terrible uh, GPU programmer, but just uh, I, I, you know, it, it's just based on my experience. It's not it's not easy. Like you know, when you uh, like to to switch from from uh, CPU programming to GPU programming because it, it requires you know uh, a shift uh, like a, a paradigm shift, right? So you need to uh, you need to now think in terms of you know uh, of a single w w work item or uh, okay that doesn't matter. But you you, you now need to think about you know. Uh, let's say in, in terms of parallel program, not sequential program, and and that's uh, and that's maybe you know maybe hard as well for other developers that you know that that, that will eventually switch from from you know targeting CPU to, to targeting GPU. So yeah, yeah. No, I felt that same discomfort. I guess, so again, I haven't done much of that, but I felt that I've definitely felt that kind of discomfort. And it's it's maybe not dissimilar to the sort of discomfort that I feel when I try to write like Rust or something, where you know you're sort of being forced to you know or, or APL or you know sort of anything. Um, you know, you're being, you really are being forced to think a little bit differently about the problem. And then that, you know, and that's, it's, it's good and bad, right? It lets you, it lets you do some things that are really, really great, but you know, it's, it's sort of, it's sort of painful in the meantime. That's true. Okay. Uh, uh, let me, let me now ask John this question. Uh, so I think, you know, you, you are one of the brightest examples of successful collaboration between academia and industry, right? So you, you obviously, uh, and I know, I mean, uh, Collaborated with, uh, with 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 Microsoft, right? With Nuno, uh, you also collaborated with Google, right? Um, so, uh, um, and, <clears throat> and let me start with this. So, so what ad advantages actually you see of such a career path, like uh, from uh, from a academia uh, career path? Yeah. So, well, one way you could phrase what you just said is one one way you think you could ask is. If I'm going to do this sort of work, why should I do it in academia? Right. And that's a question I ask myself, of course. Um, yeah, you know, and then the thing is I can sort of, uh, for, so taking, for example, C. Smith, I think there's a reason nobody had created created it in industry, <clears throat> which is that, you know, something like C. Smith sort of um, didn't offer any kind of a really compelling advantage for anyone. It didn't let them sell more compilers. And moreover, you know, compilers are mostly a cost center anyway. And so, you know, a lot of companies sort of, I think, don't seem to, you know, be super, super eager to put massive amounts of resources into a cost center. And, um, you know, so something like C. Smith, for, for whatever reason, didn't want to really, as far as I could tell, get created in industry. Um, well, you know, although it certainly it could have, and eventually I'm sure some, you know, things like it would have, but it just sort of, um, you know, it seemed like a kind of project that worked really well to be created from academia because I didn't have to sort of be, I, mean, I, wasn't, I wasn't taking a paycheck from anyone. I could sort of throw stones at everyone a little bit. Um, you know, I tried to sort of, I mean, I really didn't try, I really wasn't trying to throw stones with that project. But, you know, when, when I started finding bugs in, for example, the embedded compilers that are used to compile, you know, the products, the, the software that runs on fighter planes and stuff, I, you know, I started to get a little shrill with people at times because it was just so, it just seems so ridiculous that these, these wrong code are easy to find in, in these compilers that are so obviously uh, mission critical or safety critical. Um, so anyway, so, so that kind of a work, I, I kind of felt like it wanted to be done outside of industry. But of course, you know, obviously it could have been done at any number of industrial research labs or just as a side project by, by, by somebody. But from academia, I sort of had a, had a sort of a position where I could, um, could work on such a project without, uh, you know, like again, with, sort of without taking a paycheck from anyone. And that, that, that made it really nice to work on. Um, but yeah, so, but as far as sort of interfacing with industry, yeah, I find that the, you know, the, the kind of questions academics like to work on, you know, it's, it's all interesting and stuff, but I, I, I don't, I don't really want to sit here criticizing academia, but, you know, it, it feels often very faddish to me that, you know, people sort of chase this one goal and sort of everybody chased it for a couple of years and then we chase another one. And I don't know, it, it doesn't really, it doesn't really ma mesh with how I like to think about things. Um, so I wasn't as interested in chasing those fads. So I sort of wanted to try to seek out things that, the guy, I think more kind of came from my own frustrations as being a programmer, you know, like the compiler bug thing that all came out of um, teaching a class where I was trying to show students um, some code snippets of uh, code generated by embedded systems compilers and the stuff I was showing in class were, were wrong. The compiler that we were using was so wrong that I, even on like two liners, it was coming up with incorrect things. And I, that just sort of really that bug, bugged me and bothered me. And so that, that's, that's how we got, we kind of got onto that, that whole track was, it was just, I was just annoyed that, you know, that these tools um, seem to be so much worse than they could be. But anyway, so, um, yeah, I don't know. So, so, so I feel like somebody, you know, I feel like I would be perfectly happy um, in industry, but, you know, I, I, I kind of lucked into academia or unlocked. I don't, I don't know. I still don't know what it is. And, uh, but, you know, but it's a really good place to, to work on this stuff. And I really have a lot of fun 
Like I actually like enjoy the LLVM developers meeting probably more than any academic conference I go to, or, or if not more, at least as much. It's just a really kind of interesting collection of people who are all focused on, you know, you know, the kind of stuff that I like to think about. And it's, it's just really a joy to, to go to that meeting. Um, and I, I hope it, <laughs> hope to start doing that again at some point. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. But uh, let me ask about, you know, uh, so so are there any issues, you know, with uh, with this interface, uh, like be between academia and, uh, and, and the industry? Like, yeah. well, I have lots of first how, you know, how things get done, but it's not it's not it's not really the interface between academia and industry. That's the problem. So a lot of the frustrations I have are just it's very hard to maintain software from a position like mine <clears throat> um, because sort of either I maintain it myself or students maintain it. And neither of them really works that well because the students are gonna leave and I only have so and so much time. So a lot of my day-to-day -day frustrations um, stem from the difficulty of sort of, you know, producing real software without having, you know, something like a real engineering team. Um, you know, my students, you know, they're, they're here for a relatively short time. They need to be publishing papers. You know, they have a lot of other concerns other than, you know, they're not my software engineers really, right? I can, I can use them to some extent to get work done. But it's, you know, but, I, but it's, I, you know, I have a tough time building big stuff, basically. So from my point of view, it's basically a necessity to cooperate with industry because then I could just leverage the infrastructure that y'all build. Like, you know, like, for example, LLVM or Z3 and these other things are, you know, they're just incredible. And latching onto these and, you know, improving parts of them, you know, that's relatively easy and fun. But, um, you know, and then I think I think it's kind of a symbiote that works pretty well. Um, but, you know, but again, I don't you know, there's not really any problems with industry. Um I, I think I think if I had frustrations with industry, um, well, no, I, I, guess, I guess not really. Um, it's yeah. Anyway. Okay. Well, well, well John, you wrote uh, you know a whole bunch of uh, great tools. How do you find ideas uh, for your research, and wh wh where where do you start? Well, it always comes from something that I'm frustrated with myself almost almost every time. So, for example, C Reduce came out of C Smith was emitting an unmanageable number of bug reports, and I was reducing them by hand. And then, um, and then I found this tool called Delta from from some compiler students at Berkeley that was really cool. And so th this implemented the Delta debugging algorithm, you know, from from twenty some years ago, and that worked really well. But stuck. it kept getting stuck. It, for example, take a one hundred kilobyte program that crashed GCC and turn it into a one kilobyte, but then it would stop. And then you know, I could always kind of get it started again if I deleted a few lines myself, if I made some changes myself that that, that Delta didn't understand. And so I just started one by one automating all the, everything that I had to do by hand, I just automated them sort of one by one. And, um, and that, that's how C, C reduce happened. And so anyway, I, I think basically almost everything I've done has, has come from that. Uh, basically just, just you know, something, something doesn't feel right and not enough people seem to be addressing it. So, I'll, so that's what I'll work on for a little while. Cool. Yeah. Um, well, uh, but how, how would you rate you know, the, the adoption of, of those tools uh, that you developed? How would I rate it? I don't know. So, so, so let's talk about CSmith for a second. Um, there's a lot of users of it that I don't hear about much. So one of my favorite things that ever happened was CSmith <coughs> got a Christmas card signed by the entire compiler team at a at an industrial compiler company one time. You know, years and years ago. I just thought that was the coolest thing in the world, and I, I lost the card unfortunately, or I'd take a picture of it or something. Um, so you know, so so I, I, I had no idea they were using it but they felt strongly enough about it to actually send me a Christmas card or send us a Christmas card. And, you know, I, I think, I think there's some of that going on, but I don't know how many people are using it. So it's really hard to judge the adoption. And this is what makes open sourcing stuff so incredibly great. Like if I tried to charge money for something like CSmith, it never would have sold a copy as far as I, as far as I can tell. But if I give it away, then basically it can sneak in. And the problem with something like CSmith is nobody with purchasing power thinks it's a very good, something like that's a very good idea. The people who think it's a good idea are the engineers who are frustrated with, with compiler bugs. And, you know, they're, they're not the ones, you know, they're, you know, they're, they're the ones who just want to work on it, but they're not going to like get their company to acquire some new software product so that they can do that, or, or at least they're not that, that likely to, or more likely they just never would have heard of it. So, so what I do, my, my policy is basically we just, almost everything my group does is open sourced. And, you know, I'm, I've been, I'm super happy to get users, you know, it's, it's really great. It's really nice to have people, people use the stuff. That's true, yeah. So what what I what, what I actually am fascinated about is that you know your tools are not only a research project; they are you know used in the industry as well, right? So for example, like like you 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 were talking about the life, right? So it's uh, integrated in, into the build bot, right? Um, to 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 some extent. So yeah, um, that's great. Um, yeah. 
yeah, no, we really want the software to sort of be out there and, you know, and Alive is one of the, yeah, it's the, maybe the one I'm, you know, even though, like I say, it's, it's you know, it's, it's Nuno's the, did the bulk of the work there and Jun Young, um, second to Nuno. Uh, I'm sort of a dis probably a very distant third, but, um, but in, but in any case, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's really great to see this out there. And I, I just super, super love it when people can report an LLVM bug and basically just sort of cite Alive as the, as the reason it's a bug. I think that, you know, the, the, the of this kind of a thing is to be sort of the authoritative semantics is to work with the community to make sure that we encode something that, um, you know, that, that reflects, accurately reflects what people want their product to mean. And, um, you know, and it's a ton of work Com doing that kind of work compared to writing papers. It's like 10 or 20 times as much work. It's, you know, it's, it's sort of, if it wasn't rewarding, you know, I certainly wouldn't do it because I, I certainly don't get any real professional, uh, you know, you don't re really get any professional credit out of that sort of work. Sure. Yeah. Well, okay. Uh, okay. Thanks, John. I actually have a few, you know, closing questions, but to everyone else in the room, uh, like if you have uh, any, you know, compiler or, or any questions that we were talking about today, then uh, that's a good time to ask. Um, no? Oh, okay. Uh, let, let me actually, you know, um, just uh, ask a few more questions, um, <clears throat> if you don't mind, John. Oh, so, uh, 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 like performance-wise, do, do, do you think that, you know, that, that the general purpose performance is dead and we, you know, and, 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 and you know, sort of uh, our plan is to, you know, uh, for extracting performance is actually, you know, build extremely specialized hardware and build uh, the, the programming models around them, or or you know or or there there are find uh, or, or there are ways how we can find uh, uh, pa parallelism in the in the existing workloads and maybe offload them to to the accelerators. So, any thoughts on that? Yeah, um, when multi-core first came out, I like to joke that they set computer science back by about ten years, um, and like. And and that, I don't know. I'm often I find I'm often really wrong about these things. I thought multi cores were going to sort of stall out at eight or twelve or sixteen, and they really sort of haven't. Um, so you know, so the question is, you know, sort of where is that going, and what do we do about it? And it's I guess I guess what I would say is, from my point of view, it's changed life. This sort of stagnation of single core performance and and all this other stuff has changed life less than I kind of would have figured felt like it would have if you had told me what the hardware world was going to look like, you know, twenty five years ago. I would have predicted you know, sort of the working lives of programmers would be different than they sort of are. So, so like I say, I don't have a whole lot of faith in my ability to predict any of this kind of stuff, but, um, but yeah, I think it's, you know, I mean, it's clear that single core performance is mostly gone and um, yeah. And, and we're going to need to, you know, basically things we need to get creative and sort of weird to, to, to exploit all these, all this, all this sort of bizarre uh, transistors that people are giving us. Right. Makes sense to me. Yeah. I, 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 I actually think the same. Okay. Uh, let's see. Oh yeah, I I also actually also wanted to ask about MLIR. So that's uh, that's something that I you know hadn't haven't uh, yet had the chance to get closely. But uh, and you said that MLIR you know uh, had fixed some of the LLVM IR shortcomings, right? Yeah. So, so do you do you, and, and 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 basically like like my my understanding of that. Uh, you can educate me if I'm wrong, but uh, um, my understanding is that uh, the MLIR will be, you know, an intermediate uh, level. Uh, like, like, so we compile our, our, let's say, C program to MLA, MLIR, then we make the high-level transformations on MLIR, and then we lower it into the LLVM IR, and we do the low-level uh, transformations on, on, on top of LLVM IR. Because, I, and as far as I know, that LLVM IR, uh, the problem is that it doesn't capture the high-level semantics of the language, right? Is that correct? Yeah, so so for example, we could do a uh, and cool if somebody did it, make or maybe somebody's doing it. I I, I, I don't know. Do a yeah a clang a clang dialect in MLIR that would uh, you know that for example is a sort of a first class IR based around the clang um, you know the clang inter, the clang uh, AST, and then yeah then we could do all sorts of all sorts of cool stuff on it. I think that'd be yeah that'd be really cool. And yeah, that's exactly that's exactly what it's for is so that the people doing that work don't have to sort of. Um, do all of the parts of making a new IR by hand, which is, you know, was, was, you know, cause honestly, it's a lot of work, a lot of tooling to build. And Chris's sort of idea there um, was just to, yeah, reduce the amount of tooling effort that it takes to spin up a new dialect and, um, and thereby let people create more IRs. And I think it'll be pretty interesting to see where it goes. 
Right. Yeah, that's cool. That's that. That will be great. Okay. Uh, any more questions from 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 the audience? One question that I have actually, John, is that you know you are hiking a lot, right? <laughs> <laughs> I try to. So does uh, and, and and by the way, you know, sorry uh, for for uh, for I mean maybe because of you know, of you being here, you missed one uh, one chance to to go for a hike. But yeah, sorry about that. So does hiking contributes uh, to your success as a scientist and the, and the researcher? Well, I think if, if I hike alone, I consider it sort of work time almost because mostly what I do is I just you know I'm I don't you know hiking is pretty easy, so you don't have to think about what you're doing, and it's just like taking a shower or doing anything else uh, sort of mechanical. You uh, you get a lot of time to, in your brain, and so I yeah no I think it's, I think it gives me a lot of time to think about stuff. And hiking with other people, of course, is different. That then it's more social, and and uh, you know I wouldn't would sort of wouldn't be able to call that you know thinking time at all. Yeah, cool. Well, thanks, John, for for uh, being with us today. Um, uh, let me ask this: uh, so a any any uh, recommendations for for books, you know, podcasts, or 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 or, or uh, you know, any other resources that you use. So tell us, please, how do you educate yourself? <laughs> well, things are hard. So I have, um, yeah, I don't know. There's there's so much out there. You know, there's just a lot of good blogs and stuff. I mean, I think the real, I think everybody here is on board with the plan, which I was going to say, which is that, you know, compiler Twitter is pretty awesome. I mean, there's all these smart people who will, you know, often answer a question, you know, especially about performance stuff. There's, you know, there's, there's people like you and I can think of, you know, half a dozen people who are, you know, immensely generous with their time, um, you know, and then it sort of exp explain stuff and, and, you know, write often write good blog posts and stuff. And I think, you know, as far as I can tell for now, Twitter is sort of the kind of the place to be for the, for this kind of, this sort of community. That is absolutely true. And I, I agree. Yeah. Um, well, okay. John, thanks. Uh, thanks for being with, 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 with us today. Uh, let me say again, thank you for, for everything that you have done, you know, for LVM community, for all your great tools and, uh, and research. Yeah. Thanks again. Uh, so many, so many insights. Uh, yeah. And I would love to see all of you join us uh, next time. Yeah. Thanks a lot and have a good rest of the day. Thanks a lot for having me. Thanks, John. Bye. Bye.